Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, how's it going? Good, Great Thanks. to see everybody. Yeah, it's good to see you. Nice. All right. Sorry, I have some loud noises here in the street. Um, Let's see. Oh, it looks like you have everybody, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah, so I think, uh, thank you everyone for jumping on a call. Um, and I think it will be great for us to start with the introductions. Uh, so everyone has a better context of the backgrounds and the, basically the experience that we're coming from. Uh, it, it usually helps us, <coughs> helps us bridge the conversation and the, the common language. Do you want to start, Artur? Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, there's some annoying bike thing outside of my uh, apartment. So I'm going to start. I, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, ex-engineer in artificial intelligence space that, um, that comes purely from a commercial space from startups and venture capital. But um, 30 days ago, a little bit more than 30 days ago, I somehow organized this uh, global community of people volunteers that are willing to work 24 7 and just help society um, you know figure out how to fight the current pandemic <coughs> and that has been basically my my full-time uh, job since and um, what what my intentions are is figuring out the best way we can be useful with all the amazing intelligence that we have so far and we, I think we're hitting like a thousand people now. I haven't checked the latest counter. And the biggest problem that I'm facing is actually the direction and the, the vision where we should be going. And that's basically the, <coughs> also the purpose of, of this call. Uh, so I guess everybody read and a little bit about the initiative, right guys? You, you know, in general what it's about and Today we will find out more about how we as scientists can contribute to this. Um, yeah, so uh, Ola, do, do are you, you finished? Yep. Uh, okay. Um, I'm good. I'm sorry, I'm also sick. So just bear with me as my voice uh, uh, sounds weird. Yeah. Okay, I guess maybe I'll continue. I know most of you here and uh, thank you so much to uh, people who I know who have said yes to joining this call. It's great to see you here. And uh, I'm a postdoc at Rockefeller University. And um, I know Artur through the nonprofit that I started in 2014. Uh, uh, he, he started a, com a startup a while ago and he was one of the startups selected to, for our IT series that we were organizing in New York. So that's how um, I know him. And then I just saw his post and what he was organizing and read about it. And I just thought it's a really awesome tool that they are developing and will be super useful for scientists now and also in the future for many different fields. So just got us excited and the activist in me just wants to do something for the current state of affairs because I. I can't, I'm not a virologist, not an immunologist, so I can't do the research directly. So that's basically it. Who wants to go next? Serge, you, you want to jump in? And quick interest, Serge has been with us for quite some time now. And he, I invited him to this call because he kind of bridges uh, both worlds, the kind of the research world, the commercial world, and potentially will be helpful for this conversation. Hi everyone, uh, so my name is Serge. I am an epidemiologist by training, but currently working in pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and I have experience with working with healthcare technologies. So I'm trying to actually, as Arthur mentioned, bridge the gap between understanding of how epi works, how technologies work, how this all combines, and how this might actually um, be finally useful for um, research people, for epidemiologists or other type of researchers working on this um, agenda. I'm ho hoping to help you guys with this as well. Thank you. Alexander, you wanna 
You want to go? Sure. Hi. So I'm uh, Alex Epstein. I'm a first year uh, graduate student at Rockefeller. Uh, so I'm, again, yeah, not a virologist or immunologist, but I am interested in uh, computational biology and data science. So I, uh, and I definitely uh, think it would be good to see, you know, the, the data is out there is kind of limited, but I think there's a lot of stuff that has kind of flown under the radar, especially coming out of other countries that have experience with this. You know, like for instance, I think most policymakers in the US don't know that uh, scientists in Wuhan think that R0 was reduced by a factor of three or so by having quarantine centers where mildly away from their families. So I think that if it would be really helpful to get that kind of information out to people uh, making policy and trying to fight the epidemic. Kara? Hi, I'm Kara Marshall. I'm a postdoc at Scripps Research in California. Um, and I know Olia and Tulsi through graduate school because we, uh, we were in the same program, I think, actually, at, um, at Columbia. So uh, yeah, I'm not a virologist either, I'm a neuroscientist, but I am really interested in helping communicate tools to other scientists, physicians, and the general public. I think that's actually something that's really important to me. So um, I would love to help out however I can. Dulcy? Oh, hi everyone. Um, I am currently a postdoc at Columbia, uh, and I'm also a neuroscientist, uh, not an immunologist or a virologist. Um, but also I'm starting to um, dabble a little bit in uh, computational sciences and deal with uh, large data sets. And uh, as a biologist, you know, there are many challenges to, um, to doing that and understanding it best. So I'm happy to help um, in any way um, in this effort. Sion Hui? Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm Hong. You can just call me Hong. H O N G. Okay. And hi, I'm a postdoc in the Rockefeller University, and I joined here after receiving an email from Olia. And I, my major is cell biology, and some of virology, and some of immunology. And I can see that. Uh, Collective intelligence of the scientists is very important to solve some problem during this pandemic. So, yeah, I, I just want to know what, what, how my knowledge can be useful to solve some problem. So, yeah, that is why I came here. And nice to meet you. Amazing. Uh, again, very diverse, uh, um, you know, skill sets and backgrounds, and hopefully we'll. I will be able to communicate as efficiently as possible uh, in terms of what <coughs> we're currently creating and what is uh, already produced. Um, to give you the context, we started this organization or a collective intelligence around the um, kind of the challenge that White House organized around the uh, data set of 50,000 scientific papers that are relevant or somewhat relevant to uh, coronavirus. And basically the challenge was to help uh, researchers and policymakers address uh, 10 uh, big questions. And we took four of those questions and kind of collectively decided that, you know, those four will be the most feasible for us to, to help with and we started working on them. So on April 16th, we actually submitted the first draft of you know, something that I believe is not that useful as, as a result, but a good showcase of what we can create and a showcase of the methodology to be able to produce results. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, guide you through the, the current results or something that we produce. Uh, the results of questionable utility and usefulness, but hopefully that will give you guys better picture of what we can possibly create together. So <coughs> we have four tasks that are, what do we know about vaccines and therapeutics for COVID-19? What is known about COVID-19 risk factors? 
Uh, the third one, what is known about transmission, incubation, and environmental stability. And the fourth one, how geography impacts the spread of COVID-19. So I'm gonna, uh, we, we have this kind of beautiful creative redundancy in terms of how each of the teams, self-organized teams, approached each of the tasks. So each of the teams were working on the same things, essentially, analyzing the scientific papers, but they all produced different results. So to showcase you how, um, how it looks like, I'm going to open the first one, which is the Drug Explorer um, uh, submission. That was a team that produced um, Drug Treatment Explorer, which allows you to see a list of most, uh, most mentioned drugs within the data set of scientific papers. And you can filter by a specific drug, like hydroxychloroquine, and be able to see the actual uh, references to it uh, with some additional metadata. Uh, as also, you can filter out by uh, the source of mentioning, uh, also by connection to any coronavirus, uh, or being found in the same paper or in the same paragraph. You can also tweak the, the matching of the algorithm. So that the attempt here was <coughs> to visualize and give ability to explore what is known about the current um, drugs and, and treatments. Um, so I'm going to switch to the second task and we're going to have some time to talk about each of those. I just want to kind of concisely and briefly go through all of these to give you the scope um, and kind of give you a mental model of what we were working on. So the second one is actually um, less of a tool more of methodology on the risk factors analysis of COVID-19. So there is a, this big notebook um, on describing how we uh, reached a conclusion how to analyze the risk factors. And there is a very interesting uh, point, which is a case study. We took the heart disease risk factors and we've um, described the methodology on how we found the most relevant papers that are related to heart disease, disease risk factors. So we produced engrams, we uh, uh, searched for relevant papers, and then we had some form of medical input, very basic one of physicians qualifying if the paper <coughs> has anything to do with the actual uh, heart disease risk factors. And as a result, we produced top 10 papers that were qualified by the medical input. So this is a good case study of the methodology but also we have uh, the actual uh, summary page that outlines uh, a list of different uh, risk factors, such as the first one is the heart disease risks. The next one is, um, is age, age-related uh, um, factor. The next one is uh, humidity. The next one is um, pollution and temperature. I think that's it. Oh, there is. Oh, there is also population density. So uh, here you can see kind of like meaningless visualizations, but something that showcases the underlying uh, engrams that we use to to produce <coughs> the results. And the, the top papers with um, like a specific risk factor, the title of the paper, the keyword anagram that was used to find this relevancy, and number of keyword occurrences, and the link to the paper. So that is risk factors analysis that is completely different from what I've shown you in the first um, uh, notebook on, on the drug ex exploring. The third one, it, is what is known about transmission, incubation, and environmental stability. And this one is more of like a search engine approach, and it actually has um, somewhat similar results to risk factors, which is a list of papers uh, with the relevancy score. So there is a question, like what is the range of incubation periods? And there is a list of papers that are potentially um, you know, useful enough to answer that, that question. And the same follows for what is the range of incubation periods, uh, then how is the persistence of the virus on services of different materials, 
and uh, so on. So again, a little bit different approach, involves different method methodology, um, more of like um, more of a standard machine learning approach uh, when it comes to search engines. And there is a little bit of explanation how it how it works. And the last one is uh, actually um, a task that we created to better understand the geo geospatial types of data. And here it's a highly visual, it's a visualization uh, that potentially can help researchers on, analyze different correlations. So even though it doesn't imply any correlations, it is able to showcase them uh, for researchers to uncover <coughs> and connect the dots. I'm gonna open the demographics one and we're gonna use Italy as the one <coughs> where the most data is available currently. So here you can quickly see the actual population density as the color of regions. Um, then you can hover and see the age brackets and different distributions of those. You can also select um, cases or deaths as, um, as a variable for uh, visualization. And you can also see the, the severity uh, by the, uh, the size of the circle underlying the, underlying the uh, specific brackets. And there are a couple of these visualizations that I are mostly targeted at understanding the correlations on, uh, on the geospatial uh, data. So that's pretty much, uh, hold on. So that's pretty much the scope of the work that has been <coughs> done bef before. And right now we're at this uh, stage where we understand that we've created some different methodologies and we want to, again, use this creative redundancy as a part of four teams, but also converge it to some form of a product for researchers to be able to use to produce some meaningful uh, insights. And as a way to uh, explain what we're trying to do, I've draw, drawn this diagram, which is uh, trying to showcase that there is potential operator, epidemiologist, at least we think that's our persona. And there is, you know, supply data that these researchers are working with. There is direction of research that they're working within. Uh, obviously, they don't start from scratch. Uh, and they have some data that they want to augment. And also, they have some di direction of research. If you're working on analyzing how public transport uh, affects something, you're not going to work on uh, analyzing the food patterns or the nutrition aspects of, of the food. And then there is environment, which is also <coughs> something that drives the actual uh, work of the researcher, be it the public health departments, universities, or nonprofits. And here I try to list out the motivations of this, these different environments. Obviously for government, it's public health and creating state or federal interventions. Uh, for private educational institutions, I actually have no idea, and you guys would be the best people for, for us to learn about that. Like, uh, obviously, you, you have labs, but we don't understand how they fit into this uh, picture. And then there are nonprofits, um, which we <coughs> also don't, don't really understand in terms of what, what and uh, how they're working on this. And then at the end of all this, like this part is actually the product that we want to create here, which epidemiologist or any other researcher will be using. And that's what Olya was mentioning in terms of this can be reused in the future. It's not only COVID-19 related. It can be used for cancer, HIV, for any type of uh, other scientific problems. And at the end, there is always the, the last mile solution, something that clinic or you know, municipalities are gonna use at, at the end of this <coughs> supply chain. So this is kind of the high level of what we call literature review, AI powered literature review tool. And um, I understand that it may all sound overwhelming and I'm already throwing a lot of information at you, um, but hopefully it, it makes sense. And now I'll, I'll uh, stop talking and, and let you guys 
tell me what, what do you think <coughs> um, so that was really interesting thank you i you I was curious if uh, maybe we should go back to each method and maybe ask specific questions if we had about them. Um, um, you so mean for example, uh, risk so factors for, or drug uh, so Like I think in the third method where it was ranking the papers according to relevancy. I'm, my question is <coughs> how does the uh, you know, algorithm ranks them and was that double checked, you know? Um, at least some of the papers where they double checked. Um, yeah, so the best way would be to um, open the risk factors uh, one, which was actually solving this particular problem of making sure that the AI system actually produces meaningful results. And that's why at the end of this, um, you know, the uh, search for relevant papers, there is medical input. So in order to make sure that the papers the heart disease model has outputted are actually relevant to medical professionals, the last stage of our pipeline uses medical annotators to read through the papers and check if the paper does indeed present heart disease as a risk factor. This includes mentions of heart disease in the abstract, heart disease correlating with increased infection susceptibility, et cetera. So as an input, we have a list of papers uh, that the heart disease model found to be relevant by a matter of keyword search. And this an output a list of relevant papers that clearly state imply heart disease as a risk factor to infection. From these, a top 10 list of papers is crafted. Um, the list of golden papers sorted by the number of keyword occurrences in the previous model. Uh, one uh, follow-up question on that. Uh, so for the <coughs> heart disease case study where it has the top 20 most relevant papers, has that uh, last step of uh, expert review been applied yet? Yes to the limits of the time and the resources that we have. Because obviously we, we don't have uh, vast research um, resources in terms of actually like people focused on heart disease, but we have physicians of uh, different backgrounds that were able to help with this step. So I also had a question about that. I think it's um, really wonderful that you had this sort of final step curation to validate the tool but there's clearly a, a scalability problem. Um, and as new research comes in, this won't be viable on a larger scale. So I was just wondering what your conceptualization of that will be going forward. Yes, so um, to give you a little bit more context, the, this product, this, these results were created within the two weeks period, which was a very short time frame for us to figure out something scalable. Uh, as of right now, we are ideating uh, something that we we call discovery engine, and I'm gonna share my, my screen with you. Um, all right, so we're trying to tackle it from the perspective that yes, like we want to create the AI powered literature review tool uh, for the purpose of reducing uncertainty for researchers operating with information. But in reality, for us to, to do that efficiently, we have to uh, scale and automate the actual uh, inference of information from unstructured data. So instruct extraction of entities, types of relationships between unstructured data, which is also dependent on us pre-processing and enriching that data. So hopefully these you know, two things will help us uh, get rid of that you know, human intensive part and we'll be able to produce much more relevant results than a, a typical you know, machine learning approach. Does that help answer your question, Cora? Uh, it does, thanks. Um, it's also, I was just wondering if, I know this is a, an entirely other <laughs> new level, but if you've considered implementing some sort of wiki um, tool that's actually somehow you know, validates uh, like physicians, people with expertise, and that this could be an ongoing thing where by, you know, their own participation, <coughs> they could help validate over time, uh, just sort of as a, you know, a collective tool. So like a public resource where people can collaborate on this specific aspect of annotation. Yeah, right. that would be amazing. And right now it's done through the spreadsheet that you know the group of physicians and other medical experts in our slack is collaborating 
So it kind of exists, but it's very limited to the scope of work. Could you, uh, I'm sorry, but could you explain one more time about the, uh, about your slide, previous slide? Yes. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I'll start from th this discovery engine uh, notion, which is a, a very unusual way to, to start th this, but it, it feels like the right one. And I'll explain why I think that's the right one. Um, when we start thinking about finding relevant papers, we immediately think of like Google or any other search engine. But the reality is that like researcher or any other person can find relevant information if they know what to look for. And that's, you know, the standard model of how search engine works. You type in keywords and you, you know what to find. Uh, for this uh, scenario, especially with this high uncertainty and zero uh, knowledge baseline, um, it's almost impossible to know what exactly to look for. And that's why we're trying to introduce this concept of discovery engine, which is helping observer uh, slash researcher to derive knowledge through the interaction with uh, him. So basically, we, we are not claiming that we are creating a tool that will derive knowledge from the uh, information and data and leave out all the uncertainty because that's absolutely impossible. But we want to reduce that uncertainty to be observable and useful for a researcher to apply within the, his direction of research. And that's kind of like the top thing, right? It, it, it is a much bigger task and I'm not sure we're gonna uh, be able to solve it <coughs> within this you know, short time span, but that's essentially how we see it being possible to address these types of problems, be it cancer, HIV, or any other uh, very complex um, systemic type of problems. And from there, we reduce it to a much more feasible uh, thing, which is the AI power literature review tool, which is reducing uncertainty for researchers operating with information. It doesn't, um, you know, help derive the knowledge. It just simply uh, outputs all the possible entities or types of relationships between the unstructured data that is relevant to your topic of interest. Uh, sorry, <coughs> um, just to kind of clarify that. So if we go back to the example of heart disease, um, cause I, I kind of, I see what you're saying in theory, but I'm trying to understand how it would happen in practice. So, you know, because I have here on your notebook, a list of, you know, 20 papers that are relevant to, uh, <coughs> heart disease for, and COVID as a risk factor for COVID-19. But if I type heart disease, COVID-19 into Google Scholar, I also get a list of 20 papers. So how would the, you know, what, 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 what happens next? I, cause I assume this is just <coughs> preliminary. What happens next that differentiates those two? Yes, so uh, that's a great question, actually. And to help you understand and build a mental construct of that, I'm going to open this Cord19 Explorer, which is a standard approach to search engine, which is you type in the uh, keyword and you get a list of papers that uh, mention that keyword. And obviously, there are more sophisticated methods of searching for information. And we've tried a bunch of them throughout the period of two weeks. And we just realized that they're not applicable to this specific scenario because first of all, of complexity, and second of all, the amount of information that, that is found. So we're trying to get to this next level and go beyond the simple keyword search because even when you start you know, looking for things like uh, Sita King Storm, you start getting so many results that like you you don't even know which ones are relevant and for you as a researcher it's impossible to scan through thousands of papers so it's it's all about reducing that uncertainty and pinpointing you as a researcher to the most relevant piece of information does it help answer the question um <coughs> sorry i still don't I'm still a bit confused. And I guess the reason why I'm confused is like, you know, this, I tried as a quick experiment, uh, just putting COVID-19 heart disease in the Cord19 Explorer and in Google Scholar. And I have the results from your notebook. 
And just glancing at it, it looks like the Google Scholar papers are much more relevant to what I was looking for than either of the others. So um, <coughs> now, again, I understand this is preliminary. Google has spent years developing their proprietary algorithm that I will never understand. And I assume that, you know, in the future, it's going to be different. But I just, I don't quite get, I still don't quite get how or like how this scientist is going to interact with this to um, in a way that they don't with Google. Yeah. So, and I, and that's completely okay that it's impossible for all of us to get uh, in sync on this because we're talking about very complex uh, subjects and you know the concepts that we're trying to introduce are also you know very novel in in mm. terms of innovation of uh, knowledge. Uh, knowledge search and knowledge uh, um, process of deriving the knowledge. Maybe um, Serge would be a good person to jump in because he has some context of it and um, also understands a little bit of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, Serge. Sure. sure, I think, guys, I think uh, one detail we should understand that um, is important is that we are not just building um, a search engine or something like that. The, the idea uh, is to build a literature review um, tool that will allow you, let's say you're a researcher, you're, you have some research question, right? So you want to accomplish that work. And you have some data potentially, uh, or you might not have data yet. So if you have this tool, imagine that you have it already, uh, it allows you not to just find the relative articles and research pieces and data sets, but it will certainly assemble this review for you, uh, you know, to read through and understand what is the context of where are you trying to build up your research uh, uh, product. So uh, this is like very um, ambitious idea, right? We don't know how to overcome certain um, issues with this. Like for example, not all the papers are available for free. You know, you have to pay for access to many of them. Uh, that's clearly a hurdle, but um, for now, what we for now, what I have seen in multiple discussions and uh, presentations uh, and demos of this idea is that uh, we are trying to find out what is the best solution that could actually help uh, different types of researchers uh, to do their work better. Let's say, you know, just give an example. Uh, I might have some data, right, from um, some of my projects, and I don't even know if this data is going to give me some um, relevant uh, breakthrough kind of uh, research products. So instead of wasting my time and, you know, reading through a million of papers uh, for months, uh, you know, of time, I just uh, basically formulate some research question and try to uh, quickly uh, look at what this product can can give me in terms of the narrative uh, review type narrative uh, in, in this specific you know agenda what I'm looking at and I can sort of quickly understand if, if there is a fit for my data for my vision in, in this uh, context which exists already and as you know uh, literature reviews they are quite um, you know they are organically assembled by the pieces of different uh, you know um, research uh, papers so it's it's not very hard to uh to, to construct uh some kind of like a proxy to a review where you can read through and understand you know if, if your vision if your particular uh data or your particular methodology or your research question fits into this uh context this is a very high level idea we don't know uh, details yet and of course, you can criticize this from many uh, directions. I, I also find this very, uh, you know, vague and uh, ambiguous yet. But um, uh, the reason for this call and for many other calls we have now with different scientists is we are trying to find out what actually we can do for you guys. Because uh, we might have some vision of that. We might have some assumptions. But of course, you as researchers, as scientists, who are working closely with the data and uh, with epidemics and with other types of uh, agendas, you're the best people to know what we can do for you. <laughs> so maybe you can comment on this first point of this like idea which I outlined about the review uh, engine and then also 
maybe we can continue in the context of what, what do you think is applicable to be done for you for the future? Yeah, if, um, if I can jump in. So I think if it's uh, the kind of uh, search engine that which, like you mentioned just now, does a literature search, but also uh, summarizes the findings, yep. I think that's like a dream of any scientist to have a tool like that available to you because a lot of time is spent looking through uh, literature and you know summarizing it for oneself for the research um, but there's a lot of very qualitative assessments that go into that you know because uh, if we're looking for instance if the question is is heart disease a risk factor uh, there might be some papers that uh, conclude that it is and there might be some papers that conclude that it isn't uh, and then like you know the job of um, when like a person is doing a literature review, uh, you would look at, oh, what were their controls uh, in either of the cases? You know, like, did they control for all other conditions that might be um, risk factors as well? And did they, like, how well did they do it in the studies that show you different kinds of results? Um, so is it possible for an AI to do that? Like, is it possible for uh, an algorithm to do that? Is, I guess my question. And the assumption that we're making that it's absolutely impossible to, you know, derive the knowledge, but we think it's possible for us to give you as a researcher a tool to reduce uncertainty to derive that knowledge. And that's something that we call this discovery engine because it basically powers you as a human qualitative, um, you know, person to, to make the final reasoning. Yeah, I think along those lines, I mean, I think what would be helpful for your project and for scientists going forward is like exactly speaking to Alexander's question and like what Tulsi was saying, like what distinguishes this, what makes it better? And there were a couple of things going through that really stood out, right? Which is that you had experts curating, um, which again, like, you know, we're scientists, but to really know if you believe a paper, it takes an hour or two hours. Um, so this like hydroxychloroquine paper that came out and looked really promising people who read it saw all these red flags in it, right? And so having some sort of curation tool to have at least a quick overview of like, what do experts think about this paper, not just what does the paper say, kind of sets this apart, right? And second, you had like a score, a relevance score. So something quick that would sort of like cue you into like, okay, this is like sort of related or not. Like, I think focusing on these sort of extra tools that sort of merge with the search engine is maybe what would help you really like push forward the importance of your your tools. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And it, here's the here's the beauty of this global collaboration that is multidisciplinary and you know multi background. Sometimes like we're producing amazing results, but we're not able to communicate them and communicate them in the right way because of the lack of the common speech, kind of and the same concepts are named differently, but that's exactly like those things that you just talked about, those were the empirical uh, learnings that we want to propagate further. Yeah, I also through you showing the examples of, um, you know, actually have the data comes out and either you have some kind of score or even in, some, in one of them, there were kind of summaries like heart disease and that, heart disease and this, so you already kind of know that this paper is about that and then you know if you want to click on it and read it or it's you know that's already super useful because you can screen much faster through the papers instead of reading the whole abstract you know even those like keywords that you find from the whole paper and with the links I, I find it super useful already so I think it's really helped me to understand more this time because we spoke on Monday and uh, yeah now I understand better um, what this means. So is your main question how to put it out for the users, for the science, the researchers, scientists who will be using it? Yeah, our main concern is the fact that we're navigating in this kind of empirical feeling that this is useful. And this call obviously helps validate that. But like we want to, to you know, construct the, the further conversation with potentially um, you know, drawing a much more clear uh, distinction, which I think uh, Alexander helped, uh, you know, a frame here and we'll try to do better in terms of showing that distinction and also understanding what is the ideal kind of user interface for you 
to do that because that's also something we learned in terms of the, the notebooks that we were showing medical professionals. They're very confusing and they're not the right format to, to work with it. So maybe if you guys have some form of, you know, uh, idea in, from your research background, that would also be helpful for the context of this conversation. <coughs> I really liked the table view in one of the methods that you have. Um, I think it's really easy to look. That's how I actually, when I do literature review, that's how I manually organize. You know, I, I have my link, I have some keywords, I have some most important findings, you know, and I have this table and then it's really easy to go back to that. So I feel like that output would be probably the easiest to scan through quickly. That's awesome. I really like the map, the uh, the locations, you know, because that looks like data almost, uh, because it has like so many features overlaid one on top of an, one another, and it makes makes it really easy to make connections between, um, you know, for instance, like age and um, severity and things like that. Um, so I thought that was very very nice. The map. And also, I think it is very, uh, it would be very important. I mean, for example, if I want to uh, start uh, some project, I need to figure out which method the previous paper were used. So, for example, even though I can focus on some specific function of a specific molecule, uh, every paper has different uh, model. Some, some researchers are doing, for example, whole knockout mouse model, and some people use, finish their study by using conditional knockout mouse, mouse model, and some of them are using in vitro system, but it takes me so much time to figure out just to find what method they use. And also, for example, regarding the virus antiviral activity, for example, uh, we, not, we don't always use wild type virus we always we there is some like modification to mimic the virus replication the virus infection system so for me it is always takes so many time to figure out which method they use and some and i'm not sure there might i can perfectly um proofread every entire uh, the previous Pub, pub, published the paper before, there might be something that I'm missing. So I think it would be very useful to compare some, make it easy to visualize what method they use regarding some uh, subject or same molecule or things like that. I think that that is, that might be very useful. That's very interesting. And yeah, like right now we have no clue because we, we come from, you know, AI and machine learning background, even though we have many different people uh, from different back, backgrounds, uh, we don't have like researchers specifically that have so much, you know, trouble uh, dealing with what you're describing. Um, what would be the best uh, kind of navigator for us to learn about this? Like, uh, so again, some keywords for us to find how people do it right now. So that probably depends on the precise question, right, that you're asking. So, for example, like when you're asking about the heart disease, here mostly we actually have all molecular people. We are all very molecular people, you know, so if you're thinking about molecules and like what happens in, within the cell, um, so, uh, you know, that's why, so for example, when Hoeng is talking about, you know, when you're searching for some molecule, I don't know, like ACE2 receptor to which the virus binds, and then you want to discover everything in the literature, and maybe you're interested to search for some method that has been employed with this molecule, you know, if you can search for both of those, that would be already super, super helpful to identify Okay. everything that has been done with that method for that particular molecule. So what you're describing, and now I think I'm, I'm finally understanding, that's the piece that I'm calling ontology in terms of like different things that exist for this particular type of direction of research, right? Because, you know, there are different types of entities, there are different types of data that exist for a specific like molecular angle of research. Right? Uh, is it clear what I'm 
saying? Like there are different methodologies, right? You can answer the same question with different methodologies. Yeah. Um, and then you want to, you, know, <coughs> you would be using something in your lab. And if you're comparing your results to something that happened before, you want to know what methodology they use so you can evaluate faster, you know, what are the underlying differences in your methods and how the result can be impacted by that. Yeah, and I think I'm I'm getting that, even though there there is this barrier of common speech. I think I understand what you mean, and I think that's what I'm trying to describe as uh, extraction of entities, types of relationships between the unstructured data, in terms of how it relates to specific angles. So, for example, for risk factors task, there is not that much like quantitative data specifically, but for transmission one and incubation there is way more quantitative data, like the periods of incubation or, um, you know, the periods for transmission on different stages of disease. And those are very different uh, and different based on the questions that you ask. Here's something that I would personally find extremely useful. You know, I think I don't have so much have trouble finding the relevant papers as I do assessing whether this paper is reasonable or should be believed and trying to get out exactly what information I want from the paper. So one thing that would be super useful, for instance, there are all these drug trials, right? Like it would be nice if, you know, and if I want to search for drug trials of remdesivir, if I go in Google Scholar, I'll get a nice list of them and it's pretty much really nice is next to the paper in the list I could see say how many people were in the sample did it have a control arm you know just so because there are these criteria that you know I can immediately decide whether I would value this paper or kind of be like okay I'm not sure that I believe that yet and uh, sometimes they really make you dig to find exactly how many people were in the sample because if it's not a large number they don't really want that front and center uh, the other and similar, the other thing is that a lot of times the data I want is like barely obtainable or it's only in some kind of supplemental file and figuring out exactly where it is and how to get it out and plot it is really time consuming and annoying. So the best example of this I have is uh, New York City's data on COVID-19, which I've been following since I live here. Uh, and you know trying to understand what's going on is really hard because on deaths for instance it says due to delays in reporting recent data are incomplete because they don't present the deaths as a function of when they were reported but as a function of when they happened and the data of when they happened is in there but it's in these random pdf files that i would have to dig up and look up one by one and manually do all of the calculations and I don't know which days are incomplete and which are not, but I do know that more than 10 people died today, which is what it currently says. So I think that would be super helpful is kind of finding out what sort of parameters are useful or finding numbers and papers that scientists are commonly interested in and figuring out how to make it easier for us to extract them. And yeah, like sample size is a great place to start for a lot of these trials. Yeah. Can I, can I add something about the uh, pharmaceutical yeah. trials? Uh, if you try clinicaltrials.gov, that should give you, you know, very um, good data and information about all the trials that are held in the U.S. and globally. So maybe Google Scholar is not the best place to look for that data, but it, it exists for sure. You can find yeah, and it's very fragmented. That's the problem. And this, you know, the, the unification of the data infrastructure is the first piece that uh, I'm trying to tackle within this, uh, you know, uh, the diagram. And the, here's the, the biggest challenge that I'm facing. Like, it, it sounds like we're all talking about the same things. And basically, the first thing that Tulsi mentioned, uh, or... Uh, or Olga also was talking about is this ontology and types of data that exist. And um, <clears throat> Alexander is talking essentially about the infrastructure to power that research. So you being able to have all of this data on hands versus going to millions of different PDFs. And we all actually did that for some of the geospatial data. Uh, for two weeks, we've been assembling the data pieces on age, on 
number of uh, ICU beds from different places. And it's a, a, a giant type of task just by itself. So I was uh, thinking that maybe like one way to categorize these studies, because uh, um, as sort of Olia was sort of mentioning, depending upon the kind of study, the factors that are important to know about the study are different. Uh, so if we're looking for, for example, as Alex was mentioning, a, a clinical trial, uh, what's important is uh, the number of people involved in the trial, the number of positive and controlled people, uh, and then the output. So maybe like the maybe the easiest way to focus in on the relevant methods would be to first categorize the paper as either like a clinical study or a drug test or something. Uh, and then depending upon what kind of study it is, then you can sort of like dig into the factors that are most important. So, you know, like um, for, if you're just doing a large scale test of drugs, which is something for instance, that some people at Columbia are doing, uh, then the important factor is to know like, what the cell type is that you're studying. You know, like you're infecting something with coronavirus and adding a drug to it and then looking for some output. So in that kind of study, what's important to know is what your like platform is and what your output from that platform is. Um, so maybe <coughs> we could like, if there was um, some sort of a way to, like a categorizing tree. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm gonna show you some something that was scary, but that's the, the first attempt uh, mm -hmm. to us to to try and do that and uh, create these clusters of similar types of papers. And because they're coming from different journals and different structures, even the section titles are all different, and there is no unified structure. It's a very hard task to accomplish. But I think, yeah, I agree. That's gonna be the first step for us to be able to even think about the ontologies for things like just clinical trials or, you know, uh, some different types of papers. I don't even know what other types of papers exist, to be honest. See, another uh, good example about methodology is, for example, uh, in, in COVID-19, it is written, it, I can see that the virus infection is male biased. So for example, I want to see, I want to check in the previous paper uh, regarding some coronavirus, I want to know uh, what type, what, what mouse model they use. Do they use male mouse or do they use female mouse? I want to check that. But to find that, I need to, if I go to PubMed, I need to check every paper. I need to open every paper and I need to, I need to check every method that Mm, they use male mouse or they use female mouse. Many people, they don't uh, include both gender. They, many of them, they include only one gender. So I roughly, I want to see only the gender of the mouse that were using when they study coronavirus. Besides, it is not SARS-CoV-2. So it is very labor consuming, but if the platform can provide if I put the keyword, for example, coronavirus and uh, gender of a mouse or biological sex, and if they can provide the information, for example, the title of paper and the next, they can mention, they can uh, give me some information which gender mouse were used and how many mouse were used. So, so it is, so then I don't need to open every uh, paper so I can see I can find that information very quickly. So I, that might be another example to specify methodology. Yep. Yeah, so it sounds like what Artur is saying about ontology is like what Tulsi is describing as this characterization of papers. I think that sounds like a great idea. You just want to phrase it in a way that scientists understand, yeah. right? And what's the better so, word? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, even simple, like if you break down the search to these clinical papers or um, research on animal, I don't know if you can go in that much detail, research on animal, research papers in general or research on animal. We try to filter out animal papers too, so that's possible, we just need yeah. some direction. And then you can just have like specific subcategories that you want to extract from those data sets, right, that you want to display for those papers. So this is something that, you know, maybe we could help come up with like how to 
what subcategories should what categories and subcategories should we name that would be understandable to all scientists and easy to use because i assume you guys have the mental construct of these different papers and you navigate them by you know filtering out everything that is not like molecular right or you know you basically know that they exist and they don't fit your direction of research uh, so maybe we can create an actual like google doc to start this collaborative like list of types of papers and we can also try to show you the feedback from the data set like how many of those papers we have and that could also be collaborative annotation process for you to tell us hey this is actually not a clinical trial and we can fine-tune the ai to to, <coughs> to be better at that does it sound like a, a an easy thing for for us to ask you guys to to help us with i think that sounds like a good way to use our skills, I think. Um, I, you know, I was just preparing, actually, I gave a webinar in Ukrainian on coronavirus and more like molecular genetics, all about it. Um, and I had to search for papers everywhere on different platforms. So, you know, coming from that perspective, especially if you're not in the field and, you know, papers in different papers or they are published on preprints, all, all over the place and you're just it's just a mess but if you have this kind of uh, database that holds everything and even anything you can read through that any 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 information that can be you know um, extracted by AI I think would be super helpful yeah I, I, I think I, I have to go uh, oh. I'm sorry, you're cutting off. Oh, yeah, I was about to say I have to leave in a second. But uh, yeah, that sounds cool. I mean, that's something that Google Scholar certainly doesn't do cat or any of these search engines is categorize papers well. So um, that would, I think, be useful. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. So uh, before you jump, jump off, uh, I, I wanted to ask if uh, you guys are OK with me uh, posting the video of this uh, meeting to our uh, internal um, the channel so we can uh, basically explain to all the AI engineers like what, what we're what we have to do because right now we're kind of lost and this is this has been an amazing call yeah yeah of course all right thank you and I, and I want to, guys, if you can uh, let me uh, add something so um, the best way to think about coronavirus it's like it's the independent research community and it's very you know, diverse and very eclectic, I would say. So I think one of our goals is now also to kind of like um, cooperate with uh, well-established uh, companies like, like, like you are. I mean, like Rockefeller or Johns Hopkins or whoever we can connect with. Because so far, I have seen an amazing um, uh, result when people from, from big tech, like people who have this... Uh, uh, vision and skills like Arthur are cooperating with people who know epidemiology and certain uh, science. Uh, that's what you usually don't see much in, you know, uh, in well-established companies or institutions. But here we have it. But now I think the, uh, the one of the goals is to actually find out how we can help you. And maybe you would have some uh, feedback on that as well, because I think it's important for us uh, you know, we, we want to be uh, able to start small from some small steps. Maybe this, even this project about the search engine, this is something very big. And I personally have a lot of skepticism because I know that uh, it's very hard to build something like that uh, that's going to be useful and usable. Uh, but if we can cooperate and, co you know, coordinate and collaborate with some um, well-established institutions, and maybe you can give us an agenda, hey, how can we solve this problem? You know what, we have about a thousand people with fantastic you know, brain power who can actually think of uh, very creative solutions. I have never seen stuff like that because uh, you, don't, you don't see that in corporations. You don't see that even in the, uh, let's say, uh, research institutions because everybody is very kind of, you know, everybody has a very unique uh, skill set and uh, epidemiologists, they don't think uh, like people from uh, big tech. But when you actually have the combination of this unique uh, 
uh, mindsets and they collaborate together, uh, that's where we can actually, you know, create something fantastic. So if you have any ideas how we can be helpful to you, to your organizations, uh, please, you know, bring that up because we, uh, so far, uh, one of the concerns, we don't even know if we are on the right track. We are looking for uh, the way to utilize this unique synergy we created, you know, uh, in this community. And I think uh, if we find those uh, channels to actually uh, produce something meaningful, that'll be a very, uh, very fantastic outcome. Thank you. Well, I think uh, a lot of examples Artur showed us today are already very useful, I would say, to many communities. Alex is leaving. Yeah, I have another call, but uh, thank you so much. Okay, really good to thank you on. so much for joining. Um, and uh, yeah, so that would be already uh, really useful to different researchers. Um, I'm trying to remember what I wanted to say. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, if you have some kind of interface that can be easily used by scientists, if you help you to classify a little bit and then put out that engine and send it to the labs who are working on this and then they can use it directly. And of course, you know, I would be happy to send an email to the labs at Rockefeller who are working on COVID-19 research and maybe they would have, would be happy to collaborate on some questions or would have some specific questions for you guys to look yeah. for. I, I think we're too early at this point, to be honest, right. but with your help, we can potentially bridge to, to that stage. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you, so how do we proceed after this? Do we need to register for Slack or anything? Uh, or? It would be amazing if you would be able to join Slack, uh, but it's not required. And truthfully, like it's a little bit overwhelming if you do. So if you do decide to do that, just brace yourself for, you know, a thousand people collaborating. That's, you know, crazy and beautiful. But it would be amazing. But also, I want to conserve your mental power to first start with this uh, Google Doc on uh, types of papers. So I'm going to follow up with the uh, link to this document, and hopefully we can uh, assemble some collective uh, knowledge on that. Sounds great. And then I guess after we do some work in the Google Doc, we could see if we want to do another call in the yeah. near future. Okay. Cara? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask one last question. You had Im implied when you were going through the different tools um, that given that they were all different, um, that you would kind of seek a unified tool, right? And I was just wondering, like, how you'll decide which elements are most important, or is that something you're doing right now, or just going forward with each independently? So I think we still uh, still are preserving this creative redundancy of four teams working on very specific angles just because it's almost impossible for us to even think about ontologies for infinite amount of questions so even though we're you know aiming to create something universal that discovery engine we want to focus on four tasks for the next month or, or so to preserve this focus Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. I, you can't even imagine how impactful this call is going to be in terms of direction and crystallization of what we have to do. And also it's, it's a, also kind of validation of all the things that we have been working on so far, because all of the things that you've mentioned uh, cumulatively, they all add up to the, the big picture of the things that we want to help solve even beyond the, the current pandemic. And who knows how, how long that, that will uh, last, but we definitely see a bunch of other, you know, common enemies beyond coronavirus, you know, all kinds of diseases, all kinds of research problems. So again, thank you so much. And I'll be following up with a, with a Google Doc link shortly. Kara Tulsi Hong, thank you so much for saying yes to this and for joining today. Sure, it was, it was really exciting to hear about everything that's going on. Thanks for having me. All right. Yeah, thanks. Okay, we'll be in touch. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.